had somebody at the church this week, and they were commenting, wow, you guys have been doing some work in your preschool nursery area. And I said, yeah, we, we had some updates there. I said, we, you know, when, one, we had a leak that we had to fix, and that you know, made it necessary. But two, we, we've just been seeing lots and lots of kids. And uh, they said, oh, yeah. And I said, yeah. I said, sometimes on Sunday, we'll have almost 30 kids during the kids' message. And they're like, wow. And I was like, yeah, I, I want to say I appreciate my church's ministry. We're going to grow this church one way or the other, and I appreciate all your contributions. So, uh, yeah, thank you for that. And uh, both ways is great for me. But uh, today, we're going to talk about our great, mighty hope that we have in Jesus, and we're going to be in the Gospel of Matthew. We're going to be in the 22nd chapter of Matthew, starting in the 41st verse. If you are a little bit, uh, you know, just a little hesitant to say, well, where is Matthew 22? Uh, in those pew Bibles in front of you, it's going to be on page 878. It'll also be on the screen behind me uh, because we are going to be spending time in, in the Word. And uh, it's the centerpiece of, of how we know the Lord and what He desires and directs us in our life. And so we're going to be there together. And uh, we're going to be looking at this question that Jesus proposes. Now, I just got to say, anytime Jesus asks a question, um, you know, many people ask questions of Jesus, but when Jesus asks a question of us, it, it, it stops us in our tracks and, and calls us to, to look a little bit deeper in who we are and, and, our, and, our, and our hope in Him. And today we're going to see Jesus as this great, eternal, priestly king. Now, we get the idea of a God who is great. Most of the time we can even get to a God, the idea of a God who lives forever and does not die. We can even get to the idea of a king that, a God who is a king who rules. He has, he has standards and laws. But let's just be honest. Uh, some of you may have come from a Catholic background, so you may have some experience in understanding a little bit of the role of a priest. But if you didn't have any understanding of a priest, that word comes across a little bit odd. Because we are not living 2,000 years ago where priests are offering uh, the sacrifices we present on, on their behalf. Uh, if, if we didn't grow up in a culture of priests, going to a, a priest for confession and, and absolution and resolve in our life, that can seem quite odd, no matter how we may have seen it depicted in the media. But we have to make no mistake because the Bible says that while there is no longer the office of a priest required because of Jesus, we have to make no mistake that Jesus is still that eternal priest that we need and that we following him have our great incredible hope. And I pray that today would be encouraging to you. I pray that today would be uh, something that helps you grow in, your, in, in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus, but also shows the incredible links and the depths that Jesus went to us because of the incredible need and depth of our sin that required him to do so, and yet he willingly did so on our behalf in love. So, We've been following the life of Jesus, seeing what he actually said, what he actually did, what he actually, uh, um, who he actually was, and why it, all that matters to us. And uh, I'm, we're going to continue doing that today. Would you stand with me as we honor God in the reading of a word, his word? Um, by the way, I said you could look at that Bible, page 878 in, in your Bible in the pew. If you're looking for it, it'll be on the screen behind me. But as always, if you don't have a Bible, that one that's in the pews, it's our gift to you, not only in this time, but to use and take with you to be yours so that you have a copy of God's Word that is readable and faithful. This is the Word of the Lord beginning in Matthew, the Gospel, uh, starting in the 22nd chapter, beginning in verse 41. This is the Word of the Lord. While the Pharisees were together, Jesus questioned them. What do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? Well, they replied, David's. He asked them then, how is it then that David, inspired by the Spirit, calls him Lord? The Lord declared to my Lord, 
sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David calls him Lord, how then can he be his son? And no one was able to answer him at all. And from that day, no one dared to question him anymore. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we're looking at a very small passage of Scripture today, but its potency is, is rich because that is found in you, the riches of your grace, the kindness of your love. And God, I pray that you would display that, that kindness today in, in, in this place, that as we speak of our great needs, we would show how you are the great promise and the provision for us. God, as we talk about sin, we would see the salvation that you have provided for us alone. God, as we speak of peace, we'll see that we're reconciled in you alone. God, as we talk about our hope and needs today, where do we go? Who can help us? We'll see that is in you today. May you be glorified, God. And may you have your work in each and every life here, including the one that stands on this stage. God, help me, but be your servant today. May people look at you and be glorified. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So every week, I say this. If you've seen any of our videos, if you've been here any time, we have one incredible lofty goal. We are trying to point people towards Jesus. We're trying to help them understand and know that he is the Lord. He is God. To know who he is and what he has done and, 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 and what he has said. That all of that helps people have a greater understanding of God. And, and so we have that chief goal to glorify God and enjoy him forever and to help others walk in his presence. That is our chief aim as believers. And the way that we do that is not getting up and just telling a bunch of stories, although sometimes stories are there. You know me. You know, sometimes they just come out. Uh, it's, uh, it's not just to try to quote a bunch of lines or read a bunch of books, although we have the source of, of God's Word to look at, and, and that is absolutely necessary. It's not just merely to give a lecture. We're to go to God's Word and says, if we want to know the Lord, we have to listen to what He has told us about Himself. And He has gifted us in His love with His Word so that we would know that. We would not be left grasping or trying to posit our best theories or, or just use our mere imagination. We would be able to say, this has the authority and sufficiency of us knowing who the Lord is, what he has declared, what is he's demanded, and what it is to walk in his joy. And so we spend time helping people do that because that's our aim. But we also, when we read the passages like this, you see all of a sudden Jesus asking questions and asking about, you know, lineage and, 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 and whose uh, sonship and, and quoting from uh, Psalm 110. And we may think, I'm, I'm a little bit lost. Uh, maybe you're not lost spiritually. You, you know who, the Lord and you have received salvation. But you're a little bit, you know, I'm, I need some information. I feel like I'm missing some, there's some, some gaps that I'm trying to figure out. And so the church has been entrusted for the, with the truth for the saints once and for all. And so we take time to see what does it mean? How does the scripture be rightly interpreted so that we don't seek to change the meaning? We don't seek to manipulate or, or remove the author's intent. God, we don't seek to take God's purpose away from it. We seek to say this is what it is meant and will always mean. Because the Bible has been told to us. The Lord has said that heaven and earth will pass away before God's word passes away. And so we always need to say, what does it say and what does it mean? And then we get started and get help. We get help for us in, the, in this work. I think whether we're filling the, and need the gaps filled in or and we get help with our life. Like, okay, I see now what is timeless, what is eternal, and yet I see what is working in my days today in its application when we understand what God says and what it means. But this is a time of worship. It's not only a service where we're worshiping before you, but we're trying to gather as everyone to worship. And anytime God reveals who he is, it calls for a response in our life. And that response is worship. It's saying, will you trust what God is saying? Will you trust what God is telling you about him? What God is telling him 
telling you about you, what God is telling you about what Jesus has done, and what God is telling us about what we must do. And here we see Jesus asking a question that is going to point to the fact that he, Jesus Christ, is the eternal king who does rule with majesty, but he's also the great priest who suffers for our sin, who mediates on our behalf, who who stands in our place, if you will. You may say, it seems like a lot. How does this moment point to all that? How does this moment point us to Jesus as the priestly king? Well, the priest's main role was to be that person of a mediator, one who would stand in the gap between God and man and show how there can be reconciliation between these far separating persons. And I mean that, far separating. Although we are created in the image of God, God is holy, we are sinful. God is always righteous. We try our best to just be right-ish. God has never led anything away from the truth, has never spoken anything that was a lie. We often avoid the truth and sugarcoat things that are half-truths so that we can just make it through the day. These are just some of the examples of the distinctiveness between us. But mainly it is that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. God is, has a standard that is righteous and glorious, and everyone else has fallen short. And so the priest job, God appointed priests to be these people that would instruct people about what God had said and help be a mediator to show that peace and reconciliation can be made. And that was established until Jesus Christ, who became the great high priest once and for all, never needing to be replaced. Because all these other priests... The Bible tells us they had to be replaced until Jesus. Because you see, life is temporary. It has a lifespan. And and you can only do work as long as you're breathing. Once you die, you cease to do that work. And so because mankind has this problem where we often do that, there was always these priests that would have to be replaced. But Jesus, who came to be the priest, who died and rose again and lives forever, he is always and never has to be replaced ever again. But what does this mean? How does this point, how does this moment point to Jesus as the priestly king? Why does Jesus use this moment? Well, let's look at some of the uh, applications of this moment and see where Jesus is mediating as this great eternal priest on our behalf. First of all, we see Jesus is mediating while the Pharisees were together. Now, the Pharisees were often together. They were a religious party of people. They had very conservative, almost legalistic at times, traditional views. In fact, they had taken uh, the scripture and, and made about 613 rabbi, rabbinical traditions and commands that you were expected to follow if you were going to be right and, and be at the level of a Pharisee. And uh, often at times, they would see the grace and the kindness of Jesus that would be extended to those that weren't obeying all those commands, that weren't living out in their own attempts at rightish perfection. He would see, they would see Jesus loving tax collectors and, and prostitutes and, and, and those who were uh, demonized and, and those who were ill and, and leprous and, 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 and poor and destitute. He, they would see this and, 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 it, and it conflicted with them. And so often you see this, this, this use of the word Pharisees is a very negative connotation because they were all the time tripping up over Jesus and then they would try to discount and diminish Jesus by questioning him, by seeking to entrap him, by seeking to belittle him. But it had come to this point, as we discussed last week, that they got to pretty much their final question. They had sent an expert in the law from their religious party to ask Jesus, out of all that is written in the Old Testament, what is the the greatest commandment? And Jesus answers, well. In fact, the expert in Mark's account says that he answered well. Um, He says, you have said, you have spoken well, Jesus. For to love the Lord your God with all your heart and to love your neighbor as yourself, there's nothing better. And so at this point, 
they're a little bit befuddled. They don't know exactly what else to ask. They don't know exactly what to do. But they're still together. There's still a, a, a gathering of people. And, and the beautiful part about Jesus, while he would often withdraw to pray and to seek time with his Father to remain in perfect obedience with the Father, you also see the heartbeat of Jesus is very missional. It's always going from this city to the next city. Not because he wanted to have just this traveling circus, but because that's where people were. And so he would go to the villages. He would go to the towns. He would go to the cities. He would go to the gathering places where people were together. And, and he wouldn't wait for them to come to him and say, here's the big arena. See the great Jesus. He would go where people were. And at this moment, the Pharisees are still together. And even though Pharisees is using a very negative connotation to us, guess what? Jesus still loved them. Jesus still loved the Pharisees. If you're not convinced of that, I would tell you to read the, the, the letters of the New Testament because there was one named Saul who actually ended up becoming a persecutor. So not only was he a Pharisee in belief, he actually put this in an application where he was seeking to have people arrested and thrown in jail and murdered for their faith in the Lord Jesus. He was seeking to suppress everything, and Jesus loved him and, and shown him his grace, and he ended up being one of the greatest missionaries ever. In fact, 13 letters of the New Testament are written by him after his conversion. And so Jesus here, after he's being questioned, and, and the, the expert asks him, Jesus doesn't just put up his hand and walk away. Like, I ain't got time for you. No, Jesus is doing the work of, of mediating by being on mission and while they're gathering and seeking that moment to speak to them. And, and then in lieu of that, because one of their greatest conflicts was whether or not Jesus is who he says he is. Whether Jesus has the authority he says he does. Whether Jesus can do what he has said he will do, and that is forgive sin. And so Jesus, in the mission of God to go where people are, he also speaks to their greatest need. He says, this is the context of where you need help. And he asks them a question while they're together. He seeks that moment where people are, not forgetting the mission of God to go to the places, even the hard places, because of his love. Not forgetting that, that people have certain needs and, and you're trying to answer the questions that they greatestly need answered. It, it does really no good if we're trying to answer questions that they already have answers to. If we're trying to tell people something they already know. I mean, sometimes we're hard-headed and we need to be reminded of that. I'm hard-headed. But for the most part, we're, we're trying to answer questions. And that is our hope. It's one of my hopes for our church is, is when people come in here, hopefully we're trying to address questions that people are actually asking. You know, where does this all come from? What are we all supposed to do? Is there a right and wrong? Is this going somewhere? How can I have peace? Questions people are asking. Jesus does the work mediating in that area where all the Pharisees are together Jesus is mediating. It's pointing to him as this priestly, missional, standing in the gap king. Also, we see Jesus is mediating while the question is being asked. And the questions that are still being asked today. But his question to them, they had often asked him questions, but now his question comes to them. What do you think about the Messiah? This is the Hebrew word, often translated uh, in, in Greek as Christos. That's where you get the word Christ. It's where we understand uh, Christianity and, and Christmas and everything that's pointing to Jesus as the anointed, appointed Son of God who fulfills that role and title. But it came from the Hebrew word Mashiach, meaning Messiah, anointed one. It says, what do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? Jesus asked them questions that are, they were asking, but are still asked today. Basically, what do you think about Christ? What comes to mind when you think about him? What, what, what enters your mind? What, what enters your, your response? I, I've often said before, A.W. Tozer uh, says that the most important question and consideration that ever faces us is what comes into mind when we think about God. Because based on our thoughts about God she reveals whether we were following him in faith, whether we know him, whether we love him, or whether we're rejecting him. It, it all boils down to what comes to mind when we think about God. And Jesus points it more directly. What, what do you think about the Christ? 
What do you think about the, the promise that has been made throughout these letters and these books, the law, the, the prophets, the, the wisdom writings, all 39 books of the, of, the, of the Old Testament that were these promises made about the fact that there is a God who is gracious, who is compassionate, who is slow to anger, who is steadfast in faithful love, and yet the same God who will not leave the guilty unpunished what do you think about the promise that he has made that one day he was going to make all things new? One day he would conquer his enemy. One day he would restore the unrighteous. One day he would be made known. And when people saw him, it would not be just anybody. It would be the one who carries the title, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, Suffering Servant, Messiah, King. What do you think of him? Now the Pharisees, these experts, they, they, they should have known the promise that was made. At this time, and you know, they didn't have the New Testament. The New Testament would, would still be written in, in the, in the day, years after Jesus' resurrection. But they had the, the Old Testament and knew that there was a promise that had been made. But what they struggled with is whether the promise had been kept. They understood that the promise had been made, but they, they, they did not understand that the promise had been kept. The, in fact, their idea of what that promise meant was more of a, of a, of a victorious warrior king. And Jesus is a warrior king who defeats his enemy, but his enemy wasn't Rome. His enemy was our sin. His enemy was our enemy. His enemy was that which plagues his people. And he kept it. But then Jesus asked another question. Whose son is he? Now this question, you, you may think, well, he's the son of God. I've been taught that since I was in Bible school when I was a kid. Pretty easy to figure out. But wrapping our heads around the fact that Jesus is equal in substance with the Father and yet is distinctive as the Son, and is distinctive from the Holy Spirit. Sometimes those even baffle our minds today. But they're asking the question, whose son is he? And, and, and there's some reasons for this. Obviously, because Jesus asked it, there's always a reason. He didn't do anything purposelessly. But they're asking basically, what is his origin? What is, what, who's the Messiah's origin to be? And they say, well, he comes after David. He comes after David. Now, they have this view that basically the further back you go, when you start talking about your parents, and then your grandparents, and then your great-grandparents, and then your great-great-grandparents, and then your great-great-great-grandparents, and then your great-great-great-great-grandparents, and then your great-great-great-great-great-grandparents, you know, the further great you got, the greater the person was. Because they had more greats. So you, if, if you went all the way back, you, there was no one greater than David as a king because he was the greatest king of all. Just as they considered Moses to be the greatest lawgiver. Just as they considered Abraham to be the greatest father of their faith. And so in authority, because they had the more greats, they had to have the greatest authority. And Jesus says, whose son is he? Now when they said David's, they did answer rightly, but they did not have the right understanding of what that intended. That's why Jesus points to what, how they answered in a moment. Because when they were saying, what is his origin? They said, well, he goes back to David. David is his origin because God had promised David that there would be someone in his lineage that would sit on a throne and they would have that throne forever. That was the promise of God to David in 1 Samuel, I mean 2 Samuel chapter 7. What's his origin? But what they did not understand, what Jesus was going to point to, what is the authority? Because they would say that David would have to be the greatest. Anybody that came after him would be lesser. And for some reason they had valid thoughts on that. Because if you look and you read the Old Testament, when you look at the kings, man, David, Solomon, Solomon had problems too, actually a lot more than David did. Um, but in the kings that follow him, you start saying, I don't know their names. In fact, they look pretty awful. Many of them were. It looked like they were lesser. 
But Jesus is saying, no, it is the promise that came to David, but he is far exceedingly greater than David. Dave, Jesus is trying to mediate his work as priest to help them understand what God has told them so they would know the hope that God has held for them, that the promise that was made is the promise that was kept, and that you have someone before your eyes that is greatest than your greatest hero. And his authority exceeds far beyond. The writer of Hebrews would point to this. Joey read it earlier. It says, therefore, since we have a great high priest, not just a high priest, a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. No other priest could say that. David couldn't say that. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness so we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in the time of need. See, Jesus is helping mediate this work by not only going to them where they're gathered together, but asking them the question they need to be asked so they can get to the answer that they need. And here's where Jesus not only asks the question, and that becomes for us Scripture, Jesus also proclaims Scripture. And so you see Jesus is mediating while the Scripture is being proclaimed. That in the proclamation of the Word, Jesus is mediating. He asked them, how is it then that David, inspired by the Spirit, obviously they, they accounted that the, the Psalms and, and, and much of the writings of David came as inspiration from the Lord. It was revelation that came from him. And so this, he says, this psalm, Psalm 110, is just as revelatory, just as inspired. It's recorded for you. And yet David, moved by the Spirit, says these words, The Lord declared to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under feet. Here Jesus is mediating because what he helps them to do is say, look, I'm not presenting to you my best ideal, my best whimsical thought, some newfangled teaching. I want to point you back to the promise that was made, knowing that all the revelation of Scripture is all that we need for life and godliness. That it's for us to have hope in the Lord so that we, as the Bible tells us, would be we would profit from the teaching and the rebuking and the correcting and the training in righteousness. That we would understand, as Paul would write, that, that Scripture has been given to us for our example. And so Jesus here is doing the work of, of mediating by saying, you need to understand you're not going to answer this by some other revelation outside of Scripture. In fact, you can only find the fulfillment of it when you go to the revelation of Scripture. And you need to understand that not only is the revelation of Scripture you need, you need to understand the source of that revelation. He says it was David that was inspired by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit was at work. It wasn't just David writing out a few random thoughts. It was the Holy Spirit working through David to give him the words, to move him to the action, so that the words that David recorded were actually the words of God for man. That Jesus presents this move of the Spirit upon the writing of, of the Word, not only the re revelation of it, but the source of it, where it comes from. Jesus is meeting to them when the Scriptures proclaim, and, and, he says, and then he says, here we're going to talk about the interpretation of it. Here's the rest of the question. How is it that David, when he's inspired by this, when he's revealing this, that he let, it led him to view his, his knowledge of the Lord this way? He says, you need the interpretation of Scripture. He says, the Lord declared to my Lord. Here's David, the king, looking at God, the Lord, who the Hebrew says is, is Adonai. It's a word that they, they use to declare God's holy lordship. And he says, he was looking to the Lord, and yet David says he was also talking to my Lord, that there was somebody that's got a greater throne than me. Someone that's got greater authority than me. Someone that's got greater sufficiency than me. Someone that's got greater power than me. And the my Lord, the Lord, declared to my Lord, the one that would have greater authority than me. And he says, I'm going to sit you at my right hand. I'm going to sit you in the place of honor. And all your enemies are going to be put under your feet. So Jesus here is meeting while the scriptures proclaim. He says, 
Look, if you're looking for any hope outside the revelation of Scripture, outside of the source of that Scripture, outside of the interpretation that comes from Scripture, then you're going to find the application of Scripture is not helpful to you. You're going to find that the promise that was made is missed by you. And here, Jesus pointed to Psalm 110, a psalm actually that's quoted throughout Scripture. It's one of the most directly quoted scriptures found in the New Testament, particularly in the book of Hebrews. Jesus points to this because what they needed was not simply a story. What they needed was not just an object lesson. Those can be useful. Stories can be helpful. What they needed was the promise made and seeing how it pointed the promise kept. And the only way you find that is by going to the promise declared. Lastly, while we're looking at this moment, how do we see the benefit and the blessing of Jesus being this great priestly king? We see Jesus mediating while there is need for reconciliation. He asks them this question, if David calls him Lord, how can he then be his son? How can your view that the son is lesser than the father... In this picture of great, 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 how can that be so if David says, I have to honor the one who's after me, the one who was promised to come? How is that possible? And Jesus is mediating here because at this moment, it says, no one was able to answer him at all. Jesus points out this because he did not dismiss the bad news that they were lacking. They were built on their self on self-sufficiency. They were building their self on their own self-understanding, their own self-rightishness. But Jesus does not dismiss the bad news. He doesn't avoid it. He says, we're just not going to go there. I'll just talk about the things that, that make them happy. Now he says, I, I need to point you to the need, because that's a part of the mediating process. You see, this is where you lack. This is where you are insufficient. This is where you fall short. This is where you remain irreconcilable. So Jesus doesn't dismiss that, because by not dismissing this, he can say, this is the problem, but let me behold and provide for you the solution that while you are this, there is a God who does immeasurably more. There's a God who restores you. There's a God that you can approach. There's a God that you can come to that far exceeds the depth and depravity of our sin. That far more conquers the enemy that brings us woe. That far upends the fear of death. The God that we are able to come to who knows what we need before we even ask, and yet he allows us and welcomes us to ask. He prefers it. That's why Hebrews, once again, pointing to this idea, this picture of Jesus as our great high priest, says, yes, there is bad news. If we were left to our own, if we were looking for any other answer other than Jesus, and we're trying to dismiss the bad news, please do not do that. See the weightiness of the bad news, but yet look to Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of our faith. Look to him, who for the joy that set before him, scorned the cross, endured its shame, so that you may finish the race. This is why the, he says, and when you come to Jesus, you have one who is a great high priest who is for you. Even in the middle of your unrighteous standing, you have one who is righteous forever for you. Who is a king who upholds all the righteous standards of the law and yet is the priest who welcomes those who do not. Because he has provided the way for them. And that one person the one name that is found under heaven by which men alone can be saved is Jesus, the Son of God. And says that's why we hold fast to this confession that, that, that we have nothing else if we don't have Jesus. We have no other priest but Jesus. We have no other king but Jesus. We have no other word but Jesus. We have no other life but Jesus. We have no other love from the heavens but Jesus. Jesus. 
That's why we hold fast this confession because he's there for us. And, and, and we have a, one who loves us and yes, he is perfect and righteous and yet he sees us where we are. And he doesn't just put up the hand and walk away. He's the loving, one that lovingly pursued us. And he does. And he overcomes. And so we are able now only because of Jesus and his great, eternal, living forever, priestly king office to come to him with boldness and receive mercy and to find grace that helps us in our time of need. So what do we do with this? What do we do as we depart? A few years ago, we talked through Hebrews, looking at what it means to see that Jesus is better. And I'll just remind you of the admonition that comes from this text Jesus shows in the Gospels, in this moment, why he is the eternal, great, priestly king that we need. And Hebrews tells us what we must do so that we do not remain left unreconciled, so that we don't remain with unanswered questions, so that we don't remain lost in crowds that are apart from Jesus. What we do is we now draw near with great assurance, saying, he beckons us to come. What we do now is we draw near to Jesus who has great authority, knowing that there's no one else I could go to that would be as good. There's no one else that could accomplish that. We go to Jesus knowing that he has great affection for us. He doesn't look at us and say, you rebellious, stinking cowards. He says, I welcome you, my child that I love, and though you may be wayward, I resolve. We come to Jesus for the great appointment of our help. We have no other plea but Jesus, but we have also no other play but Jesus. When we're broken and we're in need of help and there's no one else to call to, and we say there's no one else that cares, Jesus does, and Jesus not only cares, the Bible says Jesus has capacity to help, and he will help in our time of need. You see, the Gospels are telling us who Jesus is and the rest of the Bible is telling us what it means to follow him now that you know who he is. And today I hope you know the beauty of what Jesus alone can do and you feel the weightiness of what you need from Jesus. That's a part of the issue. He doesn't tell you this just to make you feel bad. He tells you this because Without him, that's where we stay. But with him, we have everything. Life, holiness, restoration, peace. We have the work of a great high priest who alone can save. Lord Jesus, today I pray that you would help us to worship and honor you for all that you are, but also not to dismiss what you have done. And God, I pray that you would help us also see why this weighty matter matters. For those in this room that think that they may be copacetic, may be okay without you, or just think that maybe I just need a little bit of Jesus. No, show them how their great need is only overcome by you, a great Savior. And none of us needs just a portion of you. We need all that you've done because of all that we've done. God, I pray that you would help those in this room who have wondered as, as disciples in times of dryness and difficulty, God, where can I go? Remind them of once again what it was to go to you in the first place and receive the greatest of all gifts the hope found in your name. And remind them that because you gave that gift, you by no means will turn away the grace and mercy in our time of need in these things. Show them that you are the great high priest who lives eternally forever and never turns away anyone who draws near. Show them that you are not one who is unable to sympathize but you love us deeply and profoundly.
And God, lastly, I pray that you for as a church would show us and remind us that if this is who you are and we bear your image, while there is no replacing you as the great high priest, you have sent us to places where people gather to be on your mission. You have sent us to pose the difficult questions that only you can resolve. You have sent us to proclaim the scripture which shows the promise made and the promise kept. You've sent us out as ambassadors of reconciliation. So Lord, help us to not disobey, to not neglect this work. Let us follow you, Jesus, in all that you say and do, in all that you are. It's in your name we pray. Amen.